that in ancient times all kings had at their courts a court fool and sometimes it probably was true that the fool was a crazy person who had a peculiar capacity for making inappropriate remarks and there's something about inappropriate remarks that can be very funny I remember as a child we used to play a game in which we had first of all a booklet with a story in it but every now and then a word was left blank and then uh, you were given a pile of cards that were shuffled around the players and in turn as the story was read by one person the players turned up whatever card they had and said the word and the most extraordinary things happened and in this way of course the person who could make inappropriate remarks at the right moment can sometimes bring the house down but actually as time went on the function of the fool became more sophisticated than that and he became a person whose function was not simply to make jokes and to be a funny man but to remind the monarch of his humanity so that he would never never get too stuffy you remember perhaps the lines in Richard the second where the king says within the hollow crown that rounds the mortal temples of the king keeps death his watch and there the antic sits the antic being the court fool scoffing at his state and grinning at his pomp allowing him a little time to monarchize be feared and kill with looks and then at the last comes death and with a little pin bores through his castle wall and farewell king see that was in a way the function of the fool he was reminding you of your finitude of your mortality Our society cannot stand non-participation. It cannot stand really fundamental criticism. And so it's in a very, very weak state. I remember as a boy in London going off into Hyde Park Corner and listening to people orate against anything they wanted to orate against. They could criticize and vilify even the most sacred institutions and the police would stand by and pay no attention sort of lean against the lamppost and let it all go on and that's because the people as a whole in those days had a tremendous sense of security they knew they were right and therefore there was no point stopping anybody from criticizing them. <laughs> but when you're not sure you're right you have to stifle criticism completely and the worst kind of criticism is the person who pokes fun. Non-participation of the monk isn't so bad, but the person who somehow suggests that society occasionally is something that needs to be giggled at. And you see, this is the whole position. The joker doesn't outrightly deride things. He's not a slapstick comedian. He gives people the giggles about things that they thought were terribly sacred. And that is extremely demoralizing.
The standpoint of the fool is that all social institutions are games. He sees the whole world as game playing. And that's why when people take their games seriously and put on stern and pious expressions, the fool gets the giggles because he knows it's all a game. Playing always involves a certain element of make-believe, that is to say illusion, and the word illusion is from the Latin ludere, to play. It involves the illusion of the parts being separate. And so then, there are these variety of games, the tree game, the beetle game, the butterfly game, the bird game, the cat game, the people game the human game. And if you will look on all these things as differentiated in the same way as chess and backgammon and football and hockey and polo, or as rumba, waltz, twist, minuet, or again as concerto, partita, fugue, sonata, you will begin to see that it's a perfectly reasonable attitude to look at the world as a game system. Now, you see, we're looking at the fundamental games of what we call physical and biological entities or events. But over and above those, we have the social institutions, the subdivisions of the human game. Now then, the social institution is of many kinds. It's not simply things like marriage and the family, the various forms of government, the institutions of the government, like the public health department. It's not just things like hospitals and banks and business corporations. It's not even money only, that's a social institution. So are all our weights and measures our systems of timing, our clocks. And you see, what makes these things social institutions is that they are, in another sense, conventions, things that we agree upon, from the Latin convenere, to come together. We come together in agreement about where the equator is and where longitude zero is. By agreeing about these things, we can order our lives, order our communal intercourse.
throwing the hips. She is willowy. She doesn't look very willowy underneath, as a rule, but she does when dressed in a kimono. It isn't just that nature has built in to the human organism certain attractive features about other people. It's the social institution of what is to be attractive. And of course this comes out very, very strongly in the vagaries of fashion and how to do one's hair, paint one's face, etc., etc. Social institutions go a great deal deeper than anything we've mentioned. And the most important kind of social institution is that which has to do with role-playing. Who you are. Now, when we ask the question, who are you? People think of this question in two different ways. One person, when asked, who are you, will answer, I'm a doctor. Another person will fall silent because he realizes how profound the question is. He realizes that he's been asked what his ego is. But a lot of people don't realize that when they are asked, who are you? I have noticed just a little bit of difficulty in my investigations of discussing identity with people that they fix on their role and use that to describe their identity. Their name, their family, their place in society, what they do, what their hobbies are, and so on. All these are roles. And then also there is the role of character playing. All people are more or less taught to act. We are all hams from the beginning. And we were schooled in acting in our childhood, although it wasn't called that. It was called education. It was called upbringing. But a great deal of it is schooling in acting. And you very soon learn as a child from your peers and from your parents what acts are appropriate and what are not. It is the concern of all parents that their child learns a role in life and has an identity by which the child can be recognized. It would be extraordinarily disconcerting, wouldn't it? If a child had one personality one day and another the next. But children can do that. Don't you remember as a child that you were many different personalities? Depending on your environment, that you were one person at home with your parents, you were quite a different person out alone with other children. Then when you went to visit your uncle and aunt, you were somebody else altogether, and so on. And finally, the, the, the whole trend of education is to shake all this down and make you more or less constant in every sort of social environment that you enter so that everybody knows who you are.
We are made to believe that we have a real self. That is to say, somebody who we really are and whom we have to find. To find yourself, to settle down, to grow up, you see, means to fit into a role. And there are a lot of people, you see, who are troubled in our society and who seem to be misfits and are terribly unhappy because they just can't find the role that they're supposed to fit. They don't know who they are. There is an inner pandemonium conflict. But it's obvious, isn't it, that the role you play is a social institution. Because you can't be an object to your own consciousness, at least not in the ordinary way. You are a subject from your own point of view. And you can only become an object to the extent that you adopt the attitudes that other people take towards you. Other people from the beginning of life are mirrors. And by the way they respond to you, you begin to learn what they think of you and therefore who you are. We all tell each other who we are. And so the role we play, the identity that we have in that sense, is a social institution. It's possible to wake up and realize that your ego is a game and that what we call the necessity for survival is also a game. But society is playing a very, very weird game. The first rule of which is this game is not a game. This game is serious. And so the great social institutions that we inherit from the past, like the church, are places to be serious. I don't think there ever was a jester in church. <laughs> Underlying fear that the game may be given away. 
Now that fear isn't altogether unreasonable because part of the fascination of games is that it's to get involved and in a way to forget that they are games. The actor on the stage does his damnedest to persuade you that he is moving in the real world. And children love to get completely absorbed in their games and get the actual thrill of adventure in playing at war and so on. And you see, one reason why people don't really want to know the future, why a really expert fortune teller gives most people a little bit of trepidation, is that if you know what the future is going to be, it is less worthwhile going ahead towards it. If you know the outcome, why bother? To play the game and to know it's a game can be quite fascinating and not really giving the show away but giving it away enough somehow and that you see is the joker's function. What he is doing then is he is in a point of view where he sees all that is going on as a game. He doesn't take anything seriously. <laughs>